Welcome back everybody to the San Diego Chargers franchise by week edition. Here in week 10 there is no game, there is no practice, but there is still a lot to talk about. We're going to take a look at the team today as well as stories around the league, various rookies and how they're performing, as well as take a look at the scouting board and the new stadium you will see for the upcoming seasons in this series. So let's get this going. The San Diego Chargers are 7-2 and two, and that record is good enough for the best record in the NFL. However, we have a bye week and I'm assuming most of these 6-2 and two teams are going to play and some of them are probably going to win. So I don't think that when we resume games in week 11 we will be the highest ranked team necessarily, maybe tied. Anyway, we've had a really good season. The offense has been explosive and the defense as of late has gotten a lot of pressure and they've just been a pretty good unit all around this year even though I was worried about the state of our secondary wasn't sure about Leonard Howell being a rookie starter next to Denzel Perryman but things have worked out we have the highest scoring offense but of course with our bye week now that's probably going to go down and in points allowed we are looks like bottom half of the league close to average if you can have an above average offense and an average defense, you usually are a pretty good team. So let's take a look at the divisions now and see who is leading all of these divisions. Why'd I back out? That didn't make any sense. So here in the AFC West, it is right now a two-team race between us and the Oakland Raiders. And we just so happen to not play them until weeks 15 and 17. So at the rate things are going, the AFC West will not be decided until the end of the season. Broncos and Chiefs are lagging behind trying to see if they can rebound after struggling first halves of the year. In the AFC East, currently the Dolphins are competing with basically the entire division, I guess. Dolphins on top, Bills are a half game behind, and the Jets and Patriots lag behind. Patriots are the defending Super Bowl champions. AFC South, Titans, Jaguars, and Texans are in the race. Colts are 1-7. What's going on there? AFC North. Bengals and Steelers running away with this race at the moment. And in the NFC, in the West, Seahawks at 6-3, Rams at 4-4. Four four. In the East, Giants and Cowboys have the best records. In the South, Panthers on top at 5-3. And, and in the North, the Detroit Lions in the struggling NFC North it looks like. Vikings at 1-7, Lions sitting there at 5-3 playing well. So let's take a look at our stats so far. Phillip Rivers is second this year in passing yards and probably very high in interceptions. The turnovers are still happening, but thankfully we are getting a lot of points on the board to help counter those mistakes. It's been a very efficient passing season at 73% for Phillip Rivers as his career continues. On the ground, we started off very slow, but of course the story this year has been the emergence of rookie running back Barry Inseki who continues to rip off big runs. He has five runs of over 20 yards this season, six touchdowns, and he's started to get more of the workload. He's taken away most of Andre Ellington's carries, and he's getting the red zone work and the late game work. So he's getting significant playing time at the moment, although there still is a big discrepancy in the amount of touches for the two backs, or two main backs, really. Ellington has been more of a receiving back now with the emergence of Inseki. And receiving, Keenan Allen here at 48 catches, 778 yards, 8 touchdowns. And his rookie counterpart, 40 catches, 496 yards, and 4 touchdowns. Hunter Henry is playing well. Travis Benjamin's numbers have taken a dip, and someone had to, and it makes sense that Travis Benjamin would, as we have better red zone threats, and we don't necessarily have to hit big plays where Benjamin is maybe the most valuable. Offensive line, lately they have been really struggling, we're allowing way too many sacks and our tackles need to play better. On defense, I'm really happy with our pass rush as of late as Melvin Ingram has notched another double digit sack season and Joey Bosa along with Jeremiah Atachu aren't far behind. Darius Gums has played well as an undrafted rookie, Carl Klug filled in nicely for Corey Legit. And I think our front seven rotation has gotten a lot stronger this year. So I think that recaps our season pretty well so far. We faced a lot of injury ravaged teams. We have young players stepping up, 
veterans continuing to play well, and the offense has had a really good season, although some concerns lately with the offensive line and helping keep Phillip Rivers upright. But now let's take a look at the league leaders and see who is standing out this year as Matt Ryan leads in passing yards. And Reed Berry of the Jets, we've talked about him this season. He's in the top 10. And for touchdowns, number one is Drew Brees. Interceptions, Phillip Rivers is number one and we'll try to get him out of that spot as the season moves on. On the ground, Deion Lewis leads in rushing yards while Melvin Gordon is second, which is crazy to think about after the first three, four games of the season. He was on pace for a really low yardage total, but eventually he ripped off some big runs. The offensive line gave him some more lanes and he's up to 4.4 a carry and second highest total. Although if you look at yards per game, he is not even in the top five. So obviously not having our bye week right now is helping out stats, I think. Fumbles, who's number one? That would be Phillip Rivers and Jonathan Williams of the Bills. Adrian Peterson has four. Four receivers, Mohamed Sanu is number one in receptions and yards. I don't think touchdowns, however. That's Keenan Allen and Devontae Adams. But Sanu has seven, Tajay Sharp has seven. Malik McNair, rookie for the Giants, he has six touchdowns. Let's go to defensive stats. Jameel McLean leads in tackles. Sacks, I think that they're uh, missing some of the pass rushers on this list, but Khalil Mack is again number one. He has 16. And in interceptions, Luke Keekley leads with five. So now that we're over halfway through the season, we can start looking at these yearly awards and tracking the progress throughout the rest of this season. Right now, Eli Manning is the league MVP. He's in first place. Look who's in third, though. Khalil Mack, a pass rusher, could win it. Look at his legacy score. He has absolutely dominated his first few years in the league, and he's doing it again this year with 16 sacks. Coach of the year right now, it looks like Mike McCoy is leading that list. Of course, we have the best record, so not too surprising. Offensive player of the year would be Deion Lewis. Khalil Mack, of course, defensive player of the year. Offensive rookie, it could end up being Reed Berry. We have Reggie Shepard and Barry Inseki in the top 10. Defensive rookies, DeMarco Roan has a bunch of sacks this season, and I don't think we have anybody on this list for ourselves. In the NFC, it would be Eli Manning for offensive player, KJ Wright for defensive player, offensive rookie, Josh Rasmussen, and defensive rookie, Vincent Orchard of the Packers. So how are the rookie quarterbacks faring this year? Well, there were two high-profile ones that we've talked about, Reed Berry and Josh Rasmussen, and both right now have their respective teams at 4-4. Four and four. Here is Reed Berry, the 22-year-old, and we faced him this season. We handed him a loss, and on the year, he has 14 touchdowns and 9 interceptions at this point, 61% completion. And then there is Bears rookie Josh Rasmussen, who has 12 touchdowns, 6 interceptions. Both are kind of just playing average to above average, it seems. And their teams right now are 4-4. Four and four. And I'm looking forward to seeing if either, two of those, either of those teams can make a playoff push in the second half. The Bears might have the best chance. Or actually, both their division leaders are pretty soft in terms of records. So they both have a chance to make a big impact in the second half of the year. Remember when the Titans tried drafting every good running back this year and we ended up selecting Barry and Secchi? Well, let's take a look at their carry distribution this year. DeMarco Murray has still been their lead back, and Abraham Rich, their earlier draft pick, has become their second running back behind him. Sheldon Ladler only has a few carries, and Derrick Henry only has nine. So something's got to give here. Eventually, one of these players has to be available, and that's going to be a chance for another team to, to get a running back a good value, and it's going to probably happen this offseason. I always like looking back to see the rookies that I didn't end up taking and how they're doing. Here's Sylvester Morrell of Ole Miss playing for the Chicago Bears. He has been their leading wide receiver this year. Ben Watson leads them in catches, but Morrell has 472 yards and two touchdowns. He was a, a late round receiving prospect that I thought could really exceed his value, but of course we took Reggie Shepard early on as the elite talent. Morrell's a very good player, it looks like, though he has quick development, and his ratings are all solid. So by the looks of things this year, Julio Jones was injured. 
and that led to Mohamed Sanu breaking out and having a big season. But they had another receiver ready to start alongside him. I never saw this until now. Terrell Pryor is also on the Falcons. The Browns cannot keep him around. So when fully healthy, we're talking about an offense that has Julio Jones, Mohamed Sanu playing really well, and Terrell Pryor. Another exciting trio is Odell Beckham, Sterling Shepard, and Malik McNair, who is high in the Rookie of the Year voting. He leads the Giants in touchdowns, has 409 yards. I don't think he was on my radar during the draft, but he's another big red zone threat that can that offers something different than Odell Beckham and Sterling Shepard from a physical standpoint. And it looks like they have a really intriguing offense, and there's still Victor Cruz there, and CJ Fedorowicz is a pretty good combo tight end. Now, we haven't seen the Raiders this year, and we won't until week 15, so let's see how their numbers are looking so far. Derek Carr, only 10, inter or 10 touchdowns, 5 interceptions. They are 6-2-1. They have Clifton Kinchin as their lead running back, it looks like, with 6 touchdowns and a very low average. You wouldn't expect such a low average behind this offensive line. But Amari Cooper has three touchdowns, Michael Crabtree has two, and Jarius Wright has two as well. Defensively, we know they begin with Khalil Mack with his 16 sacks. Mario Edwards also has eight. They also have veterans like Sean Smith and Bruce Irvin, so I'm excited for our eventual showdowns against them. Sometimes a change of scenery can bring a lot out in a player, and that maybe was the case here with Marquise Wilson in his five touchdown, 608 yard season thus far. Of course, we know who is throwing him the football, the league's leading touchdown passer. But the Saints here, they have both Wilson and Josh Woody, a rookie who has four touchdowns. Still have Brandon Cooks, who has produced well and Kobe Fleener with his 457 yards. I believe Willie Sneed went to the Saints. Or not, not the Saints, he was with the Saints. He went to the Rams. And currently Tavon Austin is leading them in the major categories. Remember when I didn't get the linebackers I really wanted? There were a lot on my board and they went quickly. Well, Charlie McCardell ended up with some of the more intriguing ratings from the draft class. And so far this season, not much. 34 tackles, no sacks, no interceptions, no splash plays. How many snaps has he played? 345, so he's not starting. Not sure, I think he might have dealt with an injury, but so far he hasn't had a big impact. How about Vincent Orchard, who I believe was leading Rookie of the Year voting in the uh, defensive category. Look at that, 91 hit power with range, 93 tackling and the block shedding. That's a perfect run stopper right there. I want to see his uh, zone coverage as well. 60 tackles, half a sack, any forced fumbles. Yes, indeed. Maybe recovered both of them as well. And you're telling me he has 71 zone coverage, which is pretty good for a rookie linebacker. This is one of the more complete linebackers and just intriguing players I've seen from this draft class overall. How about Lorenzo Mallard in New Orleans? He has slow development, but he already had a lot of skills that were well developed, and he hasn't played much this season. So all these linebackers I had my eyes on, not all of them are getting snaps. Leonard Howell ended up being maybe my most criticized pick of the first draft in this series. It certainly was a really weird situation seeing the linebackers go off the board so quickly. And I thought Howell would be a pass rusher. Remember, he was an outside linebacker. He just happens to fit better as an inside linebacker in a 3-4. And lately, he's come on strong. Of course, I've used him in a blitzing capacity, and he's worked there against the run. Now has 48 tackles, 5 behind the line, and a sack. And a fumble recovery. I'm hoping the rest of the year, though, he continues to show a good play outside of just, like, blitzes that put him in the right spot at the right time. Alright, we've talked about a lot of things around the league now, so I won't make you wait anymore. Let's talk about the new stadium. This was one of the things that I was most excited about with this series. I wanted to give the Chargers a new place to play, and a couple episodes ago, I decided on the new stadium and what it's going to be. I had a few different options. There were some lower budget ones and some higher budget ones, but I think I found one that fits the city, fits the fan base, and fits 
the uh, the income of the team, which has been very good this year, and we're still going to go through that. I decided on the Deluxe Canopy Stadium, and I took a look at how all these stadiums look in game. I found a video, and I like the look of the Canopy Stadium from the inside, and I think it fits well in our budget because every week you have to to give out funds to make this stadium happen. And I think that it's gonna fit into our budget. Right now I've saved up over a hundred million dollars. I have 117 million at the moment. And this year it's been very profitable because we've been so successful in selling out the stadium, which is unheard of basically. And so I wanna carry that success into a new building and hopefully generate more revenue for the team. The new stadium is going to give us a lot of high quality sections that are going to make this team more profitable. So with the success this year, I'm hoping it continues because I want to take a look at some of the things we've been able to do this year. Last season, I made the ticket prices a lot lower because I wanted to get more fans in the stadium. But this year, we've been selling out. The team has played well, so I've raised the ticket prices back up, and we've generated a lot of revenue this way. So I haven't taken a look at this yet. Let's see all the memorabilia that is selling for the team. This is all generic stuff. Let's go jerseys. 6,333 Philip Rivers uniforms last week. That's good enough for $633,000. Hunter Henry is giving us a lot of uniforms sold. Keenan Allen has less than Hunter Henry. Joey Bosa, and then Caesar Butler jerseys are selling all of a sudden. So it's not uh, Reggie Shepard, it's Caesar Butler getting in here. This is interesting because I don't set this. I don't choose who the jerseys are being sold. I don't determine this. So to see a rookie on there as of late, that's pretty cool. Memorabilia, Philip Rivers signed football and the mini helmet. That's pretty neat. Of course, with the stadium being the way it is, I can't even get into the two-star concessions. I'm hoping, I forget what the uh, the uh, starting rating is for our upcoming stadium, but I know it's going to be better than this. Selling a lot of chips here as I have those pretty low french fries. Yeah, you don't make a, a ton of money on some of these things, but at least Soda made that cheaper with selling 300, making $300,000 a week off of Soda. So team revenue after our last home game, and there you see our income and expenses. That's a profit of around nine million dollars. And when you figure out that we're going to be paying, you know, between one and two million a week for our stadium, if this is typical here and we can save some of the money that I built up, then we're going to be in a very good financial situation with this team. However, you have to spend money to make money in the NFL, and there is still money for us to spend. We do have some very key players with expiring contracts this year, and the top of the list is Jason Verrett, who right now is averaging for a little north than $10 million a season, and I do think he is well worth the money. So he's going to command a fairly large signing bonus and a high salary moving forward. However, we also have Jeremiah Atachu with an expiring contract, a year after I already paid big money to Melvin Ingram. So is it possible to pay two pass rushers big money? It is, but you can't pay everybody, so you have to pick and choose your spots. Right now I'd say it's more likely that Itachi receives the franchise tag from us because this is this is an offer I think that would be fair, but I don't necessarily want to put that much money into both my defensive pass rushers and then still think about Joey Bosa up soon, who is one of the most impactful defensive players we have. Other contracts upcoming include Josh Lambeau, Matt Slauson, DJ Fluker, Anthony Fasano. Lots of veterans on this list. There's Karan Reed and Tyrell Williams later this season. Last year, we didn't see many big names hit free agency. And we'll take a look. Oh, I can't go to the very top of the list right now. I have to go from the bottom. Okay, but here are players who have been re-signed. And we'd be mainly looking this upcoming year probably at safeties and more offensive line help. We still have to address that. But these great players get signed. 
Eric Reed, if he was available, he'd definitely be on the list of players I'd be looking at. So let's just travel on down this list. I think at the bottom you're going to see more of the star players. Big contract here to Jake Matthews. Oh, look at Blake Bortles, $70 million, four seasons. Along with Telvin Smith getting a big contract. Yeah, I forget who the best free agent was that actually hit the market last year. Oh, look at that for Xavier Rhodes. Six million dollars. He could have gotten way more on the market. I'm sure of it. Jaguars re-signed Bradley Roby after they traded for him, so they'll get the most out of that trade, it looks like. Seahawks. We already talked about the Cam Chancellor Thomas Rawls deals earlier this season. Teddy Bridgewater, four years, 62.3 million. To be honest, if the Vikings had kept Sam Bradford and Teddy Bridgewater wasn't going to be their quarterback of the future anymore, I was going to take a hard look at a potential trade. But Teddy is now their starter again. Sam Bradford is a Patriot, and both have received extensions with those teams. So moving forward with Phillip Rivers, I mean, I hope he sticks around. But you're going to have to keep an eye on other options in case he does decide to retire. Just seeing a lot of contracts here that aren't too surprising. Oh, come on. You can't give Khalil Mack an extra $200,000. Just give him a $100 million contract. He's earned it. He is that defense right now. He's so good. All right, almost to the beginning of the list now. And you are seeing more of the star players here, like Odell Beckham, Sheldon Richardson. There's Kelvin Benjamin, Nate Solder. Adrian Peterson re-ups with the Vikings. Antonio Brown gets a five-year deal. So a few more things you can take a look at here in the owner settings. Right now we have the 28th best value, but the 10th best team success. I'm hoping that the stadium increases our value quite a bit. I'm not sure what impact overall that's going to have, but I know that stadium is going to help us sell more concessions, probably more luxury seats, and maybe more revenue off of tickets even though we're already pretty high there. I think we can do way better. Fan happiness, we are 10th. Still rising, it looks like. Team profit popularity, we are average. Roster rating, you're not happy with the roster I've assembled? What's wrong with you fans? Team stadium, there is still a team worse. So the bye week is wrapping up and we'll take a look at what is to come in the next weeks. We have the Eagles, Chiefs, Giants, Jaguars, Raiders, Broncos, and Raiders for the rest of the season. The Eagles and Chiefs are both 3-5, and five, but we lost to the Chiefs already. The Giants are 6-2 and two with a very good-looking offense. That could actually be the offensive showdown that actually delivers. Then the Jaguars, who are 5-3, and three, the Raiders, who are 6-2-1 and one these two weeks, and the Broncos, who are 3-4-1, and one, and we already beat them 31-28. And the final thing we will take a look at today is the scouting board to this point. And obviously much more will still happen on this list, but I'm targeting a lot of the same positions I was last year. Let's begin with quarterback. If Phillip Rivers retires, options are thin. One quarterback projected in the first two rounds, and I've scouted every draftable quarterback, and look at this. Five of them have undrafted grades. Jackson Robinson haven't finished his, but I don't think I will. Maybe? For five points, I probably will, honestly. Cole Hartman from Notre Dame. He's the top option by far, and whoever wants him is going to have to take him early. But after that, you're going to be having to go look at undrafted players and free agency. So if Phillip Rivers retires after this year, going to be very very interesting what happens afterwards now as of late our safety play has picked up but I still want to look at the best talent to come out of the draft and I think my favorite safety so far are strong safeties we have a few first round prospects and Brian Macklin is my favorite a playmaker out of LSU with B zone coverage B plus hit power B minus pursuit Looking for a safety we can really depend on. 
For some reason, I tend to wait until, like, very late to add players to my watch list, so this is pretty incomplete. But I always love looking for value, like 6th, 7th round guys that you can take safely in the 5th round. And Brandon Yancey could be one of those players, a 3-4 pass rusher. He's a power rusher, B- minus hit power, B- minus pursuit. I'm very intrigued in this 7th round prospect. I wonder what other ratings he have in that he has in that range. Definitely one of the players on my radar. And if we look at the class as a whole, there is one running back projected to go early. I did scout him. I like to know about the best players in the draft. You never know who's going to be available at your spot. But a lot of really good receivers in a year where we don't need receivers. Although I did want to scout at least a couple because all these guys going in the first round is pretty unlikely. So if you can get value later, always a good option. Some pretty good tight ends in this class. A lot in the first two rounds. Left tackle, we have some options here, but they're not elite options. Not players you typically want to take in the first round, unfortunately. So I have to scout more of these mid-round players with my points in the upcoming weeks. Guard, left guard is weak. Philip Wolf and then day three guys. Center, one player and day three guys. Right guard, two players and more day three picks. Right tackle, few more first round options but no one standing out as like a guaranteed franchise tackle that I've scouted anyway. There's still more work to do with the tackles, and I will scout more of them. A few more linebackers to look at potentially. I'm not sure if I'd be taking one early, but I want to see where the best players are so I can try getting game-changing type of players. How about Trey McMillan from Oregon, a prototype linebacker, A-minus hit power. Don't know his coverage. But I think with a prototype uh, build that he would probably have higher coverage than others. At cornerback, the early players haven't stood out as much to me. Not many complete players from the ones I scouted fully. So the draft class doesn't look great, but I think it'll uncover some value. And there are, there are really good players, but many of them are positions that I'm not looking at and probably won't be looking at for a while. So we'll sim ahead to week 11 and take one more look at the league and see if anything happened here during our bye week as we are 7-2 and two and we'll face the 4-5 and five Philadelphia Eagles in our next game. Wow, apparently right now we have the number 4 ranked defense and that's based on yardage. And our offense, what is that now? We were number 2 I think. But not playing a week can hurt your numbers and we're now the 10th ranked offense. So still a, a very good offense, I feel. Defense has played well, especially these last few weeks, getting pressure and keeping points low. So we'll see what is to come for the Chargers this season. Bakari Rambo should return for our game against the Chiefs. Travis Benjamin will return later. I think he's going to return against the Raiders in Week 15. Here's a look at the Eagles. Isaiah Crowell is their only injury, so maybe the healthiest team will have played this season. Let's take a look at our other opponents we'll face this year. The Chiefs, only one injury. They're getting healthier. Jamal Charles will not play, however, in our next game. We play them next week. How about the Giants? A couple injuries on their side, but they're mostly healthy. The Jaguars, Luke Jokel, Dante Fowler, Miles Jack and Corey Grant. So Jokel will be back. I think Grant will, but no Miles Jack or Dante Fowler for them. How about the Raiders? They were healthy at last glance and they are the healthiest team in the league. And the Broncos. To close this out, Max Garcia, Emmanuel Sanders, and Chris Harris. All right, so that's going to do it for this episode, the bye week episode here in the San Diego Chargers franchise. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like this every season for around the middle of the year to take a look at how things are going around the league and to update you on some of the stories, let me know. And if you enjoyed, please leave a like, leave your feedback down below. What do you think of this team heading into our last seven games? What do you think will be the future of this team here in Season 2? Please subscribe if you have not done so already for more San Diego Chargers franchise. And I will see you all in Week 11 against the Eagles. Have a great day.